Good evening, and welcome to the Cathedral of St. Andrew. I'm Father John Ganey. I'm the rector of the cathedral and also a Paulist priest. We are delighted to welcome all of you here this evening uh, to celebrate the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we hope that you will enter into that spirit of dedication and concern for Jesus who died for each of us as we welcome the Grand Rapids Choir of Men and Boys to what we consider and we hope they consider too to be their home. Uh, it's very important for us to see them and to welcome them here to this wonderful uh, place which is, as you know, a cathedral but also a very, very good place to sing because it has such great acoustics. So we are delighted to be able to share that and we oftentimes thank those who designed this great cathedral uh, with all that knowledge that piles in because of who they are and of the artists that they were. Beloved in Christ, we gather once again to remember the last days of the earthly life of Jesus of Nazareth and to celebrate once more the transforming joy of his resurrection to new life, the ultimate triumph of light over darkness. This story touches our hearts deeply and invites us to approach God, not with foreboding or fear, but with trust in God's loving kindness and mercy. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. God stands silent. A reflection by Richard Rohr. One of the most remarkable features of the trial of Jesus was his silence. Silence is God's first language. All else is poor translation. Tonight, both sounds and silence have an important role to play. The words and music carry what needs to be he healed, and the silence creates the space for the healing
to take place. Listening for God in the silence. A poem by R.S. Thomas. It's not that he can't speak. Who created languages for God? Nor that he won't. To say that is to imply malice. It is just that he doesn't, or does so at times when we are not listening in ways we have yet to recognize as speech.
Part two, brokenness. The Altar, a poem by George Herbert. A broken altar, Lord, thy servant hears, made of a heart and cemented with tears, whose parts are as thy hand did frame. No workman's tool hath touched the same. A heart alone is much a stone, as nothing but thy power doth cut. Wherefore, each part of my hard heart moves in this frame to praise thy name. That if I chance to hold my peace, those stones to praise thee may not cease. O oh, let thy blessed sacrifice be mine, and sanctify this altar to be thine.
Part three, shepherd. A reading from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 15, verses three through seven. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his neighbors and friends together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent.
I am the door of the shep of the sheepfold. A poem by Malcolm Kite. Not one that's gently hinged or deftly hung. Not like the ones you planed at Joseph's place, nor like the well-oiled openings that swung so easily for Pilate's practiced pace. Not like the ones that closed in Mary's face from house to house in brimming Bethlehem, nor like the one that no man may assail, the dreadful curtain the forbidding veil that waits your breaking in Jerusalem. Not one you made, but one you have become, load-bearing, balancing a weighted beam to bridge the gap, to bring us within reach of your high pasture, calling us by name, you lay your body down across the breach, yourself, the door that opens into home.
Part four, obedience. The poet thinks about the donkey, Mary Oliver. On the outskirts of Jerusalem, the donkey waited. Not especially brave or filled with understanding, he stood and waited. Horses turned out into the meadow, leap with delight. Doves, released from their cages, clatter away, splashed with sunlight. But the donkey, tied to a tree as usual, waited. Then he let himself be led away. Then he let the stranger mount. Never had he seen such crowds. And I wonder if he at all imagined what was to happen. Still, he was what he had always been, small, dark, obedient. I hope, finally, he felt brave. I hope finally he loved the man who rode so lightly upon him as he lifted one dusty hoof and stepped as he had to forward.
Part five, trial. Jesus is condemned to death. A poem by Malcolm Geit. The very air that Pilate breathes, the voice with which he speaks in judgment, all his powers of perception and discrimination, choice, decision, all his years, his days and hours, his consciousness of self, his every sense, are given him by this prisoner, freely given. The man who stands there making no defense, is God. His hands are tied. His heart is open. He bears Pilate's heart in his. He lifts it up in silent love. He lifts and heals. He gives himself again with all his gifts into our hands. As Pilate turns away, a door swings open. This is judgment day. However, in the end, love will also have its way.
Part six, guilty. Crucifixion, a poem by Malcolm Geit. See as they strip the robe from off his back and spread his arms and nail them to the cross. The dark nails pierce him and the sky turns black and love is firmly fastened onto loss. But here, a pure change happens. On this tree, loss becomes gain. Death opens into birth. Here, wounding heals and fastening makes free. Earth breathes in heaven, heaven roots in earth. And here we see the length, the breadth, the height where love and hatred meet and love stays true. Where sin meets grace and darkness turns to light. We see what love can bear and be and do. Here, our Savior calls us to his side. His love is free. His arms are open wide.
Part seven, burial. Jesus' body is taken down from the cross. A poem by Malcolm Geit. His spirit and his life he breathes in all now on this cross. His body breathes no more. Here at the center, everything is still spent and emptied, opening to the core. A quiet taking down a prizing loose, a crossbeam lowered like a weighing scale, on making of each thing that had its use, a long withdrawing of each bloodied nail. This is ground zero. Emptiness and space with nothing left to say or think or do, but look unflinching on the sacred face that cannot move or change or look at you. Yet, in that prizing loose and letting be, he hasn't fastened you and set you free.
Part eight, Easter. An adapted passion meditation by Francis Spuford. All day long, the next day, the city is quiet. Families are indoors. The soldiers are back in barracks. The governor plays chess with his secretary and dictates letters. The free bread that the temple distributed to the poor has gone stale by midday, but tastes all right, dipped in water or broth. Death has interrupted life only as much as it ever does. We die one at a time and disappear, but the life of the living continues. The earth turns. The sun makes its way towards the western horizon no slower or faster than it usually does. Early Sunday morning, one of Jesus' friends and followers comes back with rags, a jug of water, and a box of the grave spices that are supposed to cut down on the smell. She's braced for the task. But when she comes to the grave, she finds the tomb open, linen thrown into the corner, and the body gone. She sits outside in the sun. The insects have woken up here at the edge of the desert and a bee is nosing about in a silken lily, thinly tucked over itself, but much more perishable. It won't last long. She takes no notice of the feet that appear at the edge of her vision. That's enough now she thinks, that's more than enough. She is weeping. The one who was crucified helps her to stand up. Don't be afraid, says Jesus. Far more can be mended than you know. These 11 words spoken by Jesus to Mary are the denouement of tonight's story. They are not just for Mary, however. They are for all of us. Following his arrest, betrayal, beating, abandonment, crucifixion, death, burial, here one more time, Jesus' words to all of us spoken on Easter morning. Do not be afraid of anything. There is no brokenness that I cannot make whole. Nor is there any situation where I will refuse to stand for you in the gap. For you must understand that there is no sin so great for my suffering on the cross is able to cover them all. Now, rejoice with me for your stone has been rolled away along with mine and I will be with you even until the end of time.